note here. It says, Frank, drums are in Viking purple just for you. If you didn't notice the purple <laughs> lights there. I appreciate that overture, but I think they're going to need a lot more than lights <laughs> when they're playing the Seahawks, huh? Yeah. Very nice, though. He didn't play baseball. All right. Well, it is a new year, isn't it? A lot of times people do make New Year's resolutions. I'm just curious, how many people did make a New Year's resolution this year? You know, if you did, just be proud. You know, I love this, you know. Just either you did or you didn't. Well, it doesn't look like too many did. Well, <clears throat> someone apparently had a lot of time on their hands and they were looking over the various New Year's resolutions that people have made over the years, and they came up with kind of a top 10 New Year's resolution list. So I'm going to give it to you, all right? So we'll start with number 10 first. Number 10, giving up drinking, obviously, again. Number nine, become more security conscious. You know, I don't think that would have made that 40 or 50 years ago, but it's kind of a sign of the times, isn't it? Number eight, get organized again. Number seven, putting something into the community. That is helping others. That's a pretty good one. Number six, learn a new skill. Number five, get out of debt again, obviously. Number four, give up smoking again. Number three, lose weight again. Number two, exercise more again. And finally, the number one New Year's resolution is spend more time with the family. And that certainly is a good one. Well, this morning, uh, I don't want to talk to you about New Year's resolutions, as trivial as they may be. I'd rather talk to you about something substantive. And this morning, I want to talk to you about prayer. And I want to have entitled the message this morning, A Prayer That Gets God's Attention. A Prayer That Gets God's Attention. Father, I thank you for the people just coming out. I know it would have been easy to stay in on a, on a rainy kind of coldish day. And so I thank you for each person that you have brought here. I pray more than anything else so that they experience your welcome. Because I believe anyone that's here came because you drew them here. And Lord, we've come not for a man or even for singing, as awesome as that is. And I certainly appreciate the worship team. We've come because we want to meet you. We want to meet the living God. So Holy Spirit, you are welcome this morning. And I would ask that you would fill me from the soles of my feet to the crown of my head. And truly, I would speak your word. I, I believe this is a word for believers this morning. A word that we all need to hear this morning, especially in the times that we're finding ourselves in. And so I just ask now and I just praise you for what I believe is a fruit that's going to be born from your word this morning. And I just thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Skip, can you play the video? So what do you pray for? You know, when it comes to prayer, a lot of people are kind of confused because they're really not sure what they should be praying for. I mean, what prayer really does grab? What prayer really does get God's attention? You ever thought about that? Several months ago, I said, you know, if you read Paul's letters, his epistles, you will see what I call anointed prayers. We see prayers that the Apostle Paul actually prayed. So if they're in the Scripture, they got to be mighty good prayers, don't you think? In fact, we saw one of those prayers in Ephesians in chapter 1. And if you missed that message, you can go to the website now and you can either you, know, you click on sermons. You can either see the video or even the podcast. And I thank you for all the work that goes into doing that. So please take advantage of that. Uh, this morning now, as we move on to the end of Ephesians chapter 3, we are going to see another anointed prayer of the Apostle Paul. So without further ado, Skip, can you just put up the scriptures that we're going to look at a little more in depth? Starting Ephesians 3, chapter four, uh, verse 14, when I think of all of this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray from his glorious, unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his Holy Spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow deep down into God's love and keep you strong. 
And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to fully understand. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. Quite a prayer, don't you think? Now I want to break that down. But you know what causes that prayer for Paul is what previously he wrote, what the Holy Spirit was revealing to him. And what the Holy Spirit was revealing to him was the incredible, awesome scope of the plan of God. All of a sudden, Paul was able to see beginning to end. And not only that, he understood and began to understand the incredible grace that God has shown, especially and in particular to the believer. And after that, he writes, here is the first prayer he has for us. It's all encompassed. Notice what he says here in verse 14. He says, may you, the believer, be empowered with inner strength through the Holy Spirit. You know, have you ever wondered what distinguishes Christianity from all of the other religions of the world and all of the humanistic philosophies? There are two things in particular. The first is grace. The religions of the world know nothing about grace. They are works-oriented. You earn your salvation. All humanistic philosophies are human effort-based. Power of positive thinking, discipline, knowledge, and, and, and putting these things and applying these things. And the more you apply them, then you will achieve self-actualization. The second thing that distinguishes Christianity from all of the other religions of the world and humanistic philosophies is the concept of power. You know, one of the great misnomers that we have as human beings is that we have the power to change in and of ourselves. Christianity says, ding, thanks for playing. No, you don't. Christianity, in fact, says you have four things going against you. You know what those four things are? Please hear these four things because it's extremely important. The first thing going against you are your genes. You have certain genes. And sorry, you were just born with those genes. The second thing you have going against you and I have going against me is our nature. We are born with a selfish nature. You notice that? We've talked about that. We saw that in Ephesians in chapter 2. We all struggle with a self-centered nature. The third thing going against us is Satan. There really is a dark, demonic world. Just look at the world. You wonder why there's so much evil and what's going on. Satan is a large part of that. You'd make a mistake not to understand that. He is a foe, and please do not underrate him. The fourth thing going against us is just the pressures of the world. The pressures of our environment, they put huge pressure on us to conform. And no matter how you know, strong you think your mind is or willpower or whatnot, they cannot stand up these four things. Christianity says flat out that you need power to change. I need power to change. So let's talk about patience just for a moment. Skip, can you put up the picture? Love that picture. <laughs> Let, let's just take a quick survey here. How many here just struggle with patience? Just, just raise your hands. I, I, I would say, most of us would say, you know, that we struggle with patience. Someone has said, patience is the key which solves all problems. Now, I, I don't think that's true, but I do think patience can certainly solve a lot of problems. Question, how do you get patience? How does a person really get patience? You know, it's a true story. There was a, a woman. She was with her young daughter, young girl, probably two or three, and they, they were in a grocery store uh, doing some grocery shopping, and a man was observing them. The, the woman had the cart. She had her daughter in the cart. And at one point, uh, the little girl, I guess they were where the cookies were, and she said, Mama, I want some cookies. And the mother said, No. And the little girl began to cry, and the mother said, now, now, Mary, now, now, Mary, just, just, just be patient, just be patient. We're halfway there, we're halfway done. And then they, 
you know, went a couple aisles later, they got to the candy aisle, and the little girl said, Mama, I want some candy. And again, the mother said, No. At this, the little girl began screaming, and again, the mother said, No, no, Mary, just be patient. Just be patient. We just got two aisles to go, and then we're going to be done. And then they finally got to the checkout line, and the little girl saw some gum. She said, Mama, I'd like some gum. I want some gum. And again, the mother said no. And now the, girl just, the little girl just let loose, and apparently she had some lungs on her, okay? And, and, the, and the mother said, no, no, Mary, just be patient. In five minutes, in five minutes, we're going to be through the checkout line. Then we can go home, and we can take a nice long nap. And so they finally got out into the parking lot. And the man followed them out into the parking lot. And he complimented the mother. And he said, what incredible patience you had with your, with, with, with your little daughter, Mary. It was just incredible. And the mother looked shocked. She said, no, no, no. My name is Mary. My daughter's name is Laura. <laughs> and, you know, we get a laugh at Because we've all done self-talk, haven't we? But is self-talk really going to get you where you want to go? Is it really going to get you patience? Let me just give you a little inside information about how I attempt to get patience. And the key is this, it's grace. I need to flow in the grace of God. You need to flow in the grace of God. Does anyone here know who or what grace personified is? It's actually in the text. We saw it in verse 16. If Skip can get it up there, grace personified is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the embodiment of grace. So when I find myself in a situation where I require grace, I don't start talking to myself. I say, now, Frank, you need to be patient. Frank, you, you need not to rip this person's head off. Breathe in. Breathe out. Count back from 100, 100, 99, 98. See, I don't do that. It may work temporarily, but it's not going to get me where I want. Do you know what I do? I just stop myself. I say, Holy Spirit, I need patience. I need you to empower me now. I need you to release patience. I need to be able to love this person as Jesus would love this person. So what I say, I just stop myself and just pray. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of God will begin to take over me, and I have a God sighting. I have a God sighting. You know, I've said it before, and I'm going to tell you again. The Christian life is not difficult. The Christian life is impossible. It is a supernatural life. And the Apostle Paul writes this in Galatians chapter 5 and verses 22 and 23. He writes this. I don't know if Skip, you got that? Watch this. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, or faith, and self-control. There is no law against these things, meaning you can do them to your heart's content. Now, please notice, am I producing the fruit of the Spirit? Can I do it through self-effort? Can I do it through self-will? No, who's producing it? It's the Holy Spirit producing it. That's what it means to live in grace. To live in the grace of God is to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. Please hear me. To live in the grace of God is to be able to tap in to the Holy Spirit and the power of God, and you really begin to change. And I'm just just telling you, I'm really beginning to learn to do this and practice. It is fantastic. It is fantastic when you can begin to tap into that supernatural power and you really begin to see changes in your life. And you know what? It creates a real humility in you. When you finally grab, I I can't love Susan the way I should love her. Joy just isn't within me. Or peace, or patience, or kindness. Any of those things. I can't do it, and I know I can't do it. So how could I be proud? How could I be proud? How could you be proud? It really, really, you know when someone's flowing in the Holy Spirit because they have tremendous humility. They know they're not doing it. And that's why I start every morning out this way. And I'm 57, and I'm just losing strength and power. And I said, Lord, I just can't do it today. I I just cannot do this. I cannot act like Jesus. I cannot be like Jesus. I don't even want to be like Jesus today. Circumcise my heart. 
circumcised the laziness, the darkness, the selfishness in me. And I just ask, Holy Spirit, please fill me now. Fill me. Fill me from the soles of my feet to the crown of them. Release that love within me. Let me have the ability to be like Jesus and act like Jesus. And you know, all day long, I'm in prayer. You know, it says, Paul says, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Some of them, well, I can't do that. I, I got a job. I got a real job. I don't just work a half day on Sunday like you do. <laughs> and I said, no, no, you're, you're not understanding. You can be an attitude of prayer all day long. And all of a sudden, you don't even know I'm praying. Half the time I meet some of you people and I'm really praying. I said, Lord, help me with this person. No, I mean, no. see, you can be praying in a situation. I don't care if you're in a business situation. And, and literally you can stop. While you're listening to the person, you can say, Lord, I know you put me in this situation. You've allowed this situation into my life. I need supernatural wisdom. I need patience with this person because I want to squeeze my boss's neck. See, you can be saying, praying this silently. No, God is really real. The Holy Spirit is really real. And he will give you the... You will, you will be amazed at, at, at ideas that you have because you're just not as smart as you think you are. But you see, no, no. But you see, if you're in an attitude of prayer and you ask for wisdom, all of a sudden you'll be amazed at thoughts and ideas that will pop into your head. They really will. And this is what it means, by the way, to be living a supernatural life. It really is. And we all can do that. It is possible to live a supernatural life. So let's move on. Verse 17. Paul then says, then, that is the result of the Holy Spirit empowering you. So everything's based off the Holy Spirit empowering you. Now watch this. Then Christ will make his home in your heart because you trust you have faith in him. I don't think any of us would say there's nothing more important as a believer than to have faith in Jesus Christ, right? I mean, without faith, you cannot please God. So faith is extremely important. The question is, where does faith really come from? And uh, the Apostle Peter certainly understood this. In Matthew chapter 14, we see a great story. Most of you are familiar with the story, Peter walking on the water. Skip can show the picture. But the context of the story is this. Is it, it's night, and the disciples are in the boat. A storm comes up on Lake Galilee, and they can be a whopper of a storm. And, I mean, waves are crashing over the boat. Remember, this is at night. They're not hardly making any progress whatsoever to where they want to get to. It looks like the boat is going to capsize. And suddenly, the disciples see Jesus walking on the water. Now, that would get your attention, wouldn't it? It would get my attention. And Peter, you know, God bless his soul, he decides he wants to do some water walking, you know? And, you know, and we all say that he's impetuous, and he is impetuous, but I'll, I got to give this guy credit. I'll tell you what, if I was one of the disciples, I'd rather be in the boat where it's relatively dry than outside where the raging water is. You know, water is wet. And, the, you know, Lake Galilee is deep, so I'd still rather be in the boat than out of the boat. So you got to give Peter credit. Now, everything, though, hinges on this story on verse 28. Skip, can you put up verse 28 of Matthew chapter 40? Here, watch this. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, so Peter wants to make sure it's not a ghost, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Peter first asked the Lord of the water if it's okay to do some water walking. He, Peter just go, I got great faith. I declare I can walk on the water. That's moronic. And we've got some people teaching that today, that you can just declare it and you can do it. No, that's stupidity. Peter first asked him. Now, we all know the story. Peter lumbers out of the boat. He begins to walk on the water. Things are going swimmingly. And then what happens? No pun intended. And all of a sudden, he sees a tsunami-like wave. And there's a tsunami-like wave, and there's a Lord. And Peter makes a split decision. He decides the tsunami-like wave has more power than Jesus does. And what happens to him? He begins to sink. Then Peter does something very bright. Do you remember what he did? He prayed. He prayed. Now, he prayed a very long, eloquent prayer, didn't he? Lord, help me! <laughs> See, everybody thinks they got to be eloquent. They don't have to be. I mean, it's one of the shortest prayers in the Bible. And Jesus reaches that. No, and he picks him up 
out of the water. And please notice what Jesus says to him. Skip, do you have that? Look what Jesus says to him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? The reason why Peter sinks is because he lost faith in Jesus' ability to to keep him walking on the water. No question about it. And so many people then go, well, Peter's just a spiritual lightweight. No, no, no. Do you realize that Peter, when this occurred, did not have the Holy Spirit? Peter did not have the Holy Spirit empowering him. Look again at what Paul writes in verses 16 and 17. Skip, can you put those up of Ephesians? Look what he says. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he, the Holy Spirit, will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you have faith or trusting in him. Where does real faith come from? It's, again, linked to the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit is being released in your life, he will produce what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faith, or faithfulness, self-control. Even there, do you know that there is a direct correlation when the Holy Spirit is being released in you and me? I will have incredible faith in Jesus and his word. I will have power, and I will be able to begin to live it out, and so will you, and you'll begin to live victoriously. You will actually begin to able to live victoriously. You know, Paul writes this in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13. He says this, For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Now, what's he talking about here? Is is Paul saying, you know, if I have enough faith in Jesus Christ, and if the Holy Spirit is just radiating through me, I can bench press 300 pounds. Is that what he's saying? Or is he saying, is Paul saying, you know, if, if, if I have enough faith in Jesus Christ and the Spirit's radiating through me, I, 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 can, I can take any job I want and, and, and you know, I, I, I'll raise to the presidency. Or I can pick out any stock and, and it'll make me a million dollars. Is that what he's saying? See, context, context, context. The context here isn't that you can do any. The context is of Philippians 4.13 is that you and I can live an overcoming life like Jesus Christ. Do you see the difference? The context is I can do all things through Jesus Christ is I can be an overcomer like him. Let me just give you a few examples. In Matthew in chapter 6 it says, don't worry. Jesus says it. Read it for yourself. Don't worry. It is a sin to worry. You know, we treat it as a minor thing. Anybody here worry? No, but we don't really. You say, why does God not want you to worry? Because I'll tell you why. Because it robs you of your life. You can't be fully in present in the moment. I challenge you to be fully in the present in the moment and be worrying. So you're meeting with somebody. They're talking to you. And you're worried about a problem at your work. How's that going to work out? It's not going to work out. It doesn't work out. Jesus says, don't work. He he means it. He doesn't just give a meaningless command. He really wants you and I to live successfully. He wants us to experience life. You cannot experience life and be in worry. It's possible not to worry. How about this one? In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says, forgive. No, Jesus says, forgive. Do you know the basis of having deep, Intimate and good relationships is the ability to forgive. You know, that's why most marriages stink, basically, after four or five years. Do you know they've done studies on couples after seven years? The average couple no longer even kisses on the mouth anymore. You know why? Because that's where we hurt one another, with our words. With our words. And, you know, it, it, it's tragic. And so, you know... It, 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 we give ourselves away. We have all these marriage conferences. Have you ever noticed that there's all these marriage conferences? People are going, I've got to go to another marriage conference. They're reading marriage books. They even go to, 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 to marriage-type classes. And don't get me wrong, they get really good information. But you know what? There's really very little change. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, they're changed, but it's superficial. It doesn't last very long. So I want to be transparent here, all right, for a moment. The transparency is this. I have been a Christian for 36 years. Of those, I've been a minister, a pastor for 35 years, or 30 years, and I've been married to my lovely wife, Susan, for 35 years. 
Now, you know, if, if uh, and, 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 and here's, here's the transparency. Out of those years that I've been a pastor, I've gone to one marriage seminar. It wasn't bad. I've read two marriage books, two marriage books. Now, if, you, if Susan were here, Susan's actually teaching, so it works out to my benefit. You have to run her down. <laughs> now, if Susan were here, and she would ask, you know, to, to rate our marriage from zero to 10, zero being on life support, and 10 being paradise, you know what, what, what number do you think Susan would give? No, she wouldn't give a 10, I wish she would. She would give an eight. She would give a solid eight, sometimes a nine, and I know what some of you are thinking, you're going, well, you're married to an angel, because you're not, <laughs> you know. And there's some truth to that. There's some truth to that. But how can you have a good marriage? I, see, I suggest to you the problem is not information. Have you ever noticed Ephesians chapter 5? Anybody read Ephesians chapter 5? You're, you, you've gotten ahead. Ephesians chapter 5, you know what it's called? It's called the relationship chapter. And they, 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 they kind of give job descriptions. So the job description for a husband is given there. Skip, can you put up the job description for a husband, okay, in a marriage? Here it is. For a husband, this is it. This is, this is your total job description. For a husband, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. Susan likes to say, you know what that means, Frank? Because she always interprets the Bible for me. <laughs> she goes, it means that you're to cherish me. Cherish me. And that she's really not wrong on that. What it means is, is that as Christ gave himself for the church, I'm to give myself for my I'm to pour into her. I'm to do everything within my power to make her all that God intended her to be. Now, you think any woman would find problem with that? Really pouring into your wife, saying you're the most important thing. You're the first thing I'm going to pour. You're, you're more important than my job. You're more important than the kids. You're more important than success. You're the most important thing. You think a woman's going to have trouble with that? Now, let's look at the women's job. We're, we're going to get into this more later. We just, all right, here's the women's job. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. And we hear a collective, oh, you know, groan. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Leadership, all I'm going to say about this right now is leadership matters. The man is to be the spiritual leader of his home, Period. Chaos is not any good. In fact, Paul further defines the woman's responsibility, job description, with one more word. Skip put it up, Ephesians 5.33. And the wife must respect her husband. So here it is. The husband must love his wife. My job description, I know you can go to all the seminars you want. I'm, I'm, I'm making it really, this is for free, by the way, all right? So the, here it is. The husband, you got to love your wife. Uh, and, and, and wives, you must respect your husband and his leadership. Anybody not under, is there anybody here who doesn't understand that? Th those words, just, just raise your hand. Anybody, see, the problem isn't knowledge. That's my point. You know what the problem is? With it? It's carrying it out. No, see, we, 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 we don't get it. It's a misnomer. We think if I go to the marriage tomorrow, I get these books, blah, 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 plunk down the money, go see some counselor, blah, blah. No, you got knowledge. That, that's not the problem. It's a power problem. I want you to walk out of here and understand you got a power problem. I got a power problem. In fact, I set you up because you know what's before all these relationship verses? Anybody know? Ephesians 5, 18. Skip, put it up. Do not be drunk with wine because it'll ruin your life. In other words, you will, alcohol will control you and just write stupid on your head. Right. See, when you get drunk, you dumb, do dumb things. I do dumb things, stupid things. So he says, but instead, what? Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Ah, see, there's the power. So he, 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 he realizes you can't love your wife, husband. I'm sorry. Go ahead and try. Give it all the willpower you want. Read all the books you want. You don't have it in you, and I don't have it in me, to love Susan the way I should. I just don't. And wives, it's not in you to respect your husband. And there's a whopper of a problem. But the Holy Spirit, see, that's why the Holy Spirit's crit. This message is absolutely essential. The Christian life is not difficult. It's impossible. It is a supernatural life. And I'm going to be talking to you more about the Holy Spirit but I want, and how he needs to be released in you. But it's absolutely said You cannot. You can have all the knowledge you want. You need power. I need power. 
I got to close because I know we're running out of time. I just want to hit one more thing. So Skip, put it up. The last thing. And then here's the third thing, and it's tied again. And may you have the power to understand. Remember, this is connected to the Holy Spirit, as all God's people should. How wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ. Oh, God, that we would. Though it is too great to fully understand, then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. You know, There's probably nothing more essential than you know that God loves you. But you know what tragic, the the tragedy is? Most Christians, at least in America, really, over 70% don't really experience the love of God. Did you know that? And you know what the interesting thing is? I can sit here until I'm blue in the face and say, God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. You can have someone singing over you. That God loves you. You can, you know, you can, you can go to all the seminars you want. But see, we don't get it externally. That isn't going to help you to really know that God loves you. You might have a temporary change, but it won't be lasting. And you know why so many of us have such low self-esteem and such timidity? No, it's a shame. It's because we just don't know the love of God and the approval of God in our lives. That's why we are in the mess that we are, and we sin the way we do. And do you understand it's all, again, tied back to the Holy Spirit? When the Holy Spirit's being released in you, he releases the love that God has for you and the approval that God has for you. And it's life changing. Do you see? Then you will be, look at then you'll be complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. But again, it's supernatural. You're not going to get it through reading more, listening more. You're going to get it through the Holy Spirit being released in you. And see, that's humble. So the first step, if you really want to begin to experience the power of the Holy Spirit, you have to say, I don't have it. That's really humble. I can't do it. I can't drum it up. No willpower. I need you. Holy Spirit, I just, that, that's why you see me before. I'm, I'm not kidding. I can't do this. I'm a high introvert. You see a miracle every Sunday. The last place I want to be is right here. I'd rather be where you guys are, and I'd like to laugh at the guy on the stage. (laughs) It is possible to live a supernatural life. I challenge you this afternoon. I'll tell you who's going to win. We'll make it real simple for you, okay? It'll be the Seahawks, and it'll be the Packers, all right? So now you don't have to watch the games. (laughs) Really read and study these things because if the Holy Spirit becomes strong, now you're going to begin to live a supernatural life. Oh, I pray for each one of us and myself. Oh, that the Holy Spirit would empower each one of us so that our faith in Jesus would be steeped in our hearts and his love would be shed abroad in our hearts. And then we would be overcomers. Oh, Father, there's so much here. So hard to translate it with words. But Christianity never was an intellectual religion, ever. It's a religion. It's a faith that says what's really necessary is having a living God inside of us. The person of the Holy Spirit releasing his mighty power so that we can live in faith, experience love, and be overcomers. I pray that for myself. I pray that for my brothers and sisters. I pray if anyone doesn't know you right now, the first step is just to be extremely humble and say, Jesus, I need you. I know I've sinned. I know I am selfish. I have hurt so many people. And I know you died on the cross for my sins, and I'm humbling myself, and I know I need that receiving of that forgiveness. Cleanse me, adopt me, and then please give me your Holy Spirit. What an incredible gift the Holy Spirit is that he be released in me. I ask for this in your precious name. Amen. Again, those are great words, powerful words, but the question is, is it true?
if he's living inside you, then you're going to have the abundant life. Just giving a short note to remind you, uh, giving statements will save us some postage. Pastor's Lunch Fund can grow, therefore. Then so, so if you just pick up those statements in the back, that would be great. Uh, and also, in all seriousness, if, if you're new here to the church, just visiting for the first or this is your second time, we are planning to have a newcomer's class on Sunday, 124. It's a free lunch, so anytime I see free food, I'm always there. So you get a free lunch out of the deal, but it really would be a chance for us to get to know you and just explain a little more about what Bethlehem Community Church is about and what the Holy Spirit is doing. So we certainly, if you are somewhat new or just have never, you don't have any church membership anywhere, we invite you to that. Now may the Holy Spirit, may the Holy Spirit bless you. May the Holy Spirit be strong within you. I pray that the Holy Spirit will fill each one of you with this incredible, amazing love and joy and peace and patience, kindness. You can be gentle and have great faith and self-control. I pray that this is going to be an incredible week for each and every one of you as you are living as an overcomer. Now may you have a blessed week. And God bless you all. If you want prayer, you have questions, we will have people up here to pray and talk with you. God bless you all.